Purna actually um, came um, to San Diego and she spent some time with us. She had an exhibit at our library and she had evacuated because of the hur of Hurricane Katrina and um, she showed us many of the photographs that she had been taking of her community and also of the effects of some of the flooding. Uh, since then, she's continued to do this work and she's uh, collaborated with a, a couple of architects and together they're bringing uh, a, to us a picture of what's going on in the Mississippi Delta. My intention in bringing her back is so that we don't forget what happened there, that people are still struggling, people are still haven't been able to go back to New Orleans and also the adjacent areas are seeing the effects not only of the hurricane uh, but also um, a few years ago the BP oil spill. And so um, in, in bringing this show we get uh, a picture uh, that is um, kind of a bird's eye view through the maps of the geography, of the infrastructure, of what uh, man has done with the landscape, um, of what nature has also inflicted on that on the place, um, and it gives us that bird's eye view, uh, and we can connect those dots of, of the changes also that are going on. But then Monique Verdun's work gives us that more personal view of the people and their livelihoods and how they're affected by both man-made and natural disasters. And I wanted to bring Monique Verdun here to Mesa um, because she's a young woman, not much older than many of her students, who are uh, just starting you know, in their careers here at Mesa College. And she's already somebody who's an activist. She's somebody who is um, uh, transmitting the message of what's happening um, and I just thought that it would be great inspiration for all of us. So um, help me welcome Monique Verna. Thank you. Um, thank you Mesa for inviting me back. Thank you Alessandra. I can't thank you enough for... Um, I mean Mesa's really been kind of a turning point in my life and I just want to start by saying I had never shown my work before I, I came here in 2005. I had handed Alessandra's husband a CD of my images and a month later I was here and um, showing the work and telling the story. And for me, um, the art is secondary to the story, which is that we have a severe environmental crisis happening in the world's seventh largest delta, and I happen to call it home. But it's um, an important place not just for me, um, and not just for our nation, but for the world. Um, I think it's a PowerPoint, and it's a beautiful place that has been greatly um, desecrated. So uh, thank you for inviting me here to be here to tell the story. Um, I just kind of wanted to start. I'm going to show Anthony Fontenot, the architect, one of the architects who um, helped to create these data maps. He was here the night that we were supposed to have our opening, and there was massive blackouts, so he unfortunately couldn't come up today. But I wanted to start with his slideshow, because I think it really gives a good context for the images that I'll show of, um, of the Louisiana that I know. So, um, like I said, you know, Louisiana is home to the seventh largest delta. And here are just a few images of, you know, what it looks like, and this kind of zeroes in on the delta itself. Our main problem is that the river has been channeled for many, many years, and it is uh, starving our wetlands of the sediments that are vital for their sustainability. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through these slides. Infrastructure. Why is South Louisiana important? Mm. I have a couple of the facts here that I looked on the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources today. Here's your levees, I'm not, yeah, your flood control structure, and as um, you may or may not know, we're at the mouth of the Mississippi River, so we're a very important point of entry and exit for goods, and have been for a very long time. 
Okay, Louisiana is produces or transports a third of the nation's oil and gas supply. 50% of the nation's refining capacity is in Louisiana. 30% of domestic crude is produced in Louisiana or off its shores. 20% of natural gas. Contributes six billion in federal royalties and fees. 60% of our crude is imported via South Louisiana, and 43% um, of the strategic petroleum reserve is found in coastal South Louisiana. So when you question, like, why should we pay attention to this place, keep in mind those facts. Um, we are literally fueling the nation in a fairly large way. And a lot of this flooding is not here so much to protect the people, um, the flood structures, the infrastructure, not to protect the people, it's to protect the port system. We need to have a channel that can, you know, transport goods up and down the Mississippi River and has to be navigable, and that's why the Army Corps of Engineers has intervened, and that's why your federal tax dollars actually go to the maintenance of, of these kinds of structures. Um, I'm just going to kind of flip through these because they're Anthony's and I'm sure he has many other comments, but just, uh, you saw some of these over in the gallery and I encourage you to um, to look at them deeply. I, I'm going to kind of zoom in here. This is New Orleans. Um, historically, it's been known as the Ile de Orleans, the island of Orleans, and that's because it's surrounded by water. The Delta's full of water. It's always had water. Um, it's sinking. It's always been sinking. That's what happens in a Delta. These are your modern flood protection um, levees. And so the Army Corps, their biggest deal was they decided in the 50s that if they didn't put in a structure, then by modern day, South Louisiana would no longer have the Mississippi River running through it. So they knew that in order to ensure that you know, all of these refineries and the ports and all of that could still be maintained, they were going to have to do something. Because what's one, what the river wants to do is it wants to shift, and you'll see later in these slides, the river's always shifting. They, you can't have a river shifting if you're going to have navigation. So they put in these levees, they created this dam that's essentially holding the river back from shifting. The river wants to go down the Atchafalaya River, um, which is a little to the west. And um, the Corps has figured out a maintenance main to maintain the water flow so that 70% is going down the Mississippi and 30% down the Atchafalaya. Now, when we had those huge floods in the springtime, they opened up some of those, those systems. Here's just a, um, transportation shows we have tons of railroads and you know major highway and of course the river. And here's your cities, New Orleans, of course, being the most populated. Uh, some of these images are mine and some of them are not mine. This is actually one of mine. Um, it's an island road to Lille Jean Charles and uh, you know probably 50 years ago was had, had land on both sides. Not my photograph but of the same island road. Industry. This is America and you, as you can see um, off the coast of South Louisiana is where many of your deep water drilling platforms are. And here are your pipelines bringing them, you know, our oil and gas all the way up to places as far as Boston. Platforms. This is a new technology. Um, it really wasn't invented until after World War II in the 50s and is now, you know, how most of oil and gas extraction is happening. It's not happening on land the way it was 50 years ago. It's all deep water, very deep, like the deep water horizon. I think that this is one of my most favorite maps just because it's so telling of um, the pipelines and, you know, it's like a machine underwater. Most people, when we show this map, it usually like immediately think BP, and um, it's not. Eight million gallons of oil were spilled during or after Hurricane Katrina. And in one of those areas, it was in a residential neighborhood where there's this refinery. It's not very far from my house where I live on St. Bernard Parish. 
and 1.1 million gallons dumped there. And literally, my cousin lived on the road next door and had you know two and a half feet of like this mucky oil sludge inside of his house. So oil spills are nothing new to us, I guess is my point. This is the satellite image of the Deepwater Horizon drill. Um, I'm just going to give a shout out to the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, and if you're interested, I encourage you to please go to their website. Um, it's an incredible group of people, and um, they're empowering residents to take their own air and soil samples, and, um, and we're very active in the aftermath of BP and have been very much so at the forefront. Their um, campaign is not so much litigation anymore because they realize you don't really get anywhere when you're trying to call oil and gas out, especially in South Louisiana. So um, their main ammo these days is essentially just you know, pushing their PR and um, letting the press know of what's happening and monitoring um, through citizen action, which I think is really great and informative and empowering because you feel so so much like you can't do much, you know, but there's other communities and other people out there who are, are trying to do good work and record and document what's happening. Ecology. I love this. 41% of the nation's water is drained um, through the Mississippi River, and, and that blows my mind. Um, another fact, I was talking with someone earlier about forestry, and um, I love this fact as well. So 150 years ago, we had 25 million acres of bottomland hardwood forest. Um, bottomland hardwood forests are oak trees, cypress, tupelo. They grow between 60 and 100 miles of a river system of you know, the tributaries, essentially, of the Mississippi River and along the Mississippi River. And modern day, we're down to like 5 million acres. And many of those, I want to say 800,000 of those, are in the Atchafalaya Basin, which is in South Louisiana, and many are not protected. And that's happened because of agricultural and logging and many other reasons. But um, that's huge, you know, in a really short amount of time. And when you're talking about biodiversity on the planet, I think it's something to pay attention to. Um, it's also why South Louisiana um, is even more vulnerable. I think it, when you think about it, and especially those those huge trees, they love the wind, actually. They thrive off of it. They grow from it. And if you look at an old oak tree, you can see how it can, you know, its body looks like it's shaped by the wind. Um, many of our cypress, tupelo, have all disappeared. Um, we have a barren landscape in many places, and I think my photographs um, demonstrate that. Again, your levees. These are um, 1888 levees and just how they keep going higher and higher. This is uh, right outside of New Orleans. Marsh composition, uh, 1949. So they weren't really paying much attention to land loss. But as you'll see in some of the slides ahead, um, there's been dramatic amount of land that's been lost in a really short amount of time, 1,900 square miles since 1932, or so. And that's because of these man-made canals in addition to the river control. So um, the oil and gas industry came in, and they cut up the landscape, essentially, to search for oil and gas. And they didn't know what they were doing then, um, but it hasn't... Uh, they haven't. Essentially, there are groups that are trying to hold the oil and gas companies accountable for the environmental damage that has been created because of their industry. And the oil and gas and you know oil and gas companies, they know that they have to invest in South Louisiana as far as restoration in order to protect their profits and um, products. But uh, it's a very controversial subject. But I think that you know this kind of shows like hey you know we've definitely cut up the landscape here. What happens is tidally, you know, you're changing the hydrology, you're having tides come in, you, you know, combine that with a couple of hurricanes, they just push the water in, they flip the land up, you know, it's not a good situation. But hurricanes have been happening all the time, right? They're a natural thing, we know that. 
Okay, so this is 2001 Marsh composition. And just to go back, um, kind of keep this in your head, right? I'm going to flash back. And in less than 50 years, essentially. So we're losing land at a most rapid rate, uh, fastest on the planet. May, almost. Definitely in the United States. And this is a projection by 2030, which is very scary because I live in the red zone, <laughs> as do many other people. And sacrifices are going to have to be made, so, you know. This is just saying about the 1927 floods when they put in the levee construction. This is what how the river used to flow. Now, as you saw, it's channeled, right? It just goes straight out, which is why we're losing all the sediment. And of course, it's dumping. I don't know if you guys are following this at all or if you know about dead zones. But um, from middle America, they're using all this nitrogen and fertilizers and what have you um, for the farmlands and the cotton, I mean, the corn belt. And all of that nitrogen just funnels out into the Gulf of Mexico. And we've been having these huge dead zones where everything dies, you know. And fishermen, I know, they like, you can cross the line. And when you cross the line, there just is, it's nothing survives there. Because it has these huge algae, algae blooms, and then they all die. And then the oxygen's all gone, and then nothing can live in the water. So, and this isn't just happening off South Louisiana's coast. It's happening globally. Again, there's your channeled river. So I'm going to read this. Um, Louisiana has lost up to 40 square miles of marsh a year for several decades, which accounts for 80% of the nation's annual coastal like, wetland loss. If the current rate of loss is not slowed, by the year 2040, an additional 800,000 acres of wetlands will disappear, and South Louisiana shoreline will advance inland as much as 33 miles in some areas. Um, if this was another country that was like taking this kind of land, our nation would be up in arms that we're losing this. Um, but that's not the case. <laughs> this is a really famous photo from National Geographic, image where this guy is showing, you know, the land behind was where his grandparents once lived. There's a cemetery there. So they say one, one of the equations is that South Louisiana is losing equivalent to uh, losing a football field every 15 minutes, and this is just kind of kind of get your head around that. I'm going to kind of go fast through the urban fabric because I'm not going to really focus on it too much. But I think that that this image is very telling, which is the fact that the highest elevation is actually in the middle of the river. <laughs> so you know when you're talking about a uh, river that is like, you know, I think it was cresting at like 19 feet this spring, and you would go out onto the levee, and like the water's right there, and then you look down, and the city is below you, you know, you're like, hmm, okay, you know, this is, this is a fragile existence here, you know, and this kind of demonstrates that. I want to get to this. Um, so this just shows the, all of the different delta lobes um, over the years, going from the oldest to the newest. And just kind of, you know, to think of like how a distributary used to work. I mean, essentially, our, the natural distributaries used to work. Um, it's really beautiful to think of a delta as always changing and always building land and always taking land away and the way that the water works. I mean, essentially, if we are going to save South Louisiana, we have to figure out a way to reconnect the river to the wetlands. And if we don't figure out that, then there's no hope, you know. You can um, talk about, you know, what, <laughs> what should be done or what could be done and you know, it's a long road to hoe, and of course, South Louisianans can't do it by themselves. They need the national government to help and intervene and give them permission and all that. Um, but we have some huge problems, and I think that what Jacob and Anthony Fontenot were doing with this animation, which is over in the gallery, so I apologize for kind of going fast through it, 
Um, but was to show you know, what has happened and also what our possibilities could be if we were to try and find alternative ways to reconnect the water to this land that's, that needs the, the sediments and needs the fresh water in order to combat this, this issue of land loss. Okay, um, so these are the, the active or the, the five deltas, I think that they've kind of identified um, as modern day areas that need attention. And, um, the area that I'm going to talk about is um, a place called Pomona Shan. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about St. Bernard Parish, which is where I live now, too. So the Mississippi River is here, right? And then the Atchafalaya River essentially comes off up there by the Red River. And then this is all the Atchafalaya Basin. And it's not controlled. The river flow is not controlled there. So there's lots of area for um, the water to go. And uh, this area, Terrebonne and Barataria Basin, is where we're losing the most land the fastest in all of South Louisiana. And if you think of it as like a triangle, where the Atchafalaya is coming here and the Mississippi is coming here, so all of this is suffocated from the natural waters and it's just being eaten away very, at a very, very rapid rate. I'd like to start with this um, image, which is, was taken in the 1930s in a place called Ponisham. Um, the two women on the ends are my grandmothers, my great-grandmothers, Celestine and Ernestine. And um, I think that, I, you know, I love to reference this image because I think it speaks volumes for um, how dramatically a uh, place can change and a way of life is transformed, and especially in the 20th century. So, um, I don't know if you noticed the roof, this palmettos, and then there's this mud moss chimney in the foreground. And um, photographer unknown. Uh, I was telling um, some folks earlier that when I evacuated for Katrina, my grandmother, who you'll see in the slideshow, she refused to leave. And uh, when I left her house, she was 90 at the time, she's 96 now. Um, she handed me these five old photographs, which are here. Um, and, you know, this is a record of my family history. My grandmother doesn't read or write her own name, um, but when she was telling me of where she came from and who she was and how she grew up, you know, she would use these photographs to kind of, you know, bring me to that place and, and jog her memory. This image here is of her and her brother um, when she was just a wee little girl um, many, many years ago. So this is probably, oh God, I mean, the photograph must be 90 years old. She's probably four there. And I've manipulated this image. I, I, I do love this image um, a lot. And I love my grandmother quite a bit, too. Um, she has been my gateway and my guide. Uh, into the Louisiana I know, her and many other of my relatives, family members, and friends. Um, this image here is in the, in the gallery. And uh, I think that it really captures what all of my photographs are trying to say, especially in this context to South Louisiana, which is that in my grandmother's lifetime, the landscape has changed dramatically. and man has intervened and manipulated and you know for better or for worse uh this is a landscape that i've inherited and i don't know if i'll be able to grow to be an old woman like my grandmother on our land you know that's not a for certain so um i'm going to kind of let the images play i'll stop them every now and again but I just keep in mind as you're looking at them, um, I've been photographing this girl, Allison, my cousin, um, for many, for 13 years now. And um, I'm watching these young children grow into young adults. And, you know, as the photographs and my work taking pictures and learning about Louisiana and our environment and our culture, I'm watching them have to come to terms with the landscape that, that they're inheriting and dealing with that. You know, I mean, these kids have grown up in floodwaters almost every year, so it's a very common thing, but um, 
when they're my age, when they're their grandparents' age, um, again, will we be able to live there is, is, is a question. So, um, and also keep in mind that all of these characters are related. This image here, um, this is an image of toxic waste oil pits um, in Grand Bois, which is where uh, there's a small Native American and Cajun community where my cousins live. When I first started taking images in 1998, I, I had come home from from living in Florida. I People often say that I don't sound like I'm from Louisiana, I guess because I don't have like a Cajun accent or I don't talk like a yacht or whatever, but um, I did spend some time away from 85 to 98. I lived in Pensacola, which is just three hours east. Um, and I came back at 90, in 98 as an 18 year old woman, a uh, young woman, very naive woman, and I realized that my cousins live next door to these toxic waste pits and that they don't have proper berms and they flood and it goes into the communities. It literally is like in your backyard and in your front yard when the water comes in. It's surrounded by water on, on almost three sides, you know. And this is a very flood prone area. So, you know, just south of there is land that looks like this. And every time you have a south wind blow a little too hard, a little too long, there's water in, in people's front doors. And this is why, because we have all of these canals and water and you know, land that's sinking. So I love this image, it looks like a head to me. Um, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, it's like, think about it, right? Um, yeah. So, I started taking the photographs in a way, because I was like fired up about this environmental situation that my cousins were having to fight against. And um, now, 13 years later, I have this documentation of a much greater environmental story than just Grand Bois. Um, this image here is of a shipping canal that was dredged in the 1960s by our United States Army Corps of Engineers. And modern day, it's destroyed over 600,000 acres of wetlands. And that's since the 60s, right? Um, St. Bernard Parish, which is where I live, is the big toe of South Louisiana. And um, during Hurricane Katrina, there was um, this is my grandmother's house, and she had 11 feet of water there um, at the height of the storm, but just south of her house, they had like 23 feet. So um, when you think of that, Mother Nature is very strong, um, and it was really heartbreaking to come home to, and also um, has been something, you know, that that I've definitely referenced in my future. Um, this is my picture, my photograph. Mark Krasnoff took this, and that's not our home. But um, I think it's very telling, you know, that we returned to this landscape where they were telling us, oh, make sure that you have your gas mask before you go home and your rubber boots and your, you know, and it's funny because when we had the blackout here, you know, it was like disaster PSD trigger inside of me where it's like, oh, right. A disaster can happen anywhere and at any time. And I think that we forget um, what's really important until times like that. <laughs> and if we would remember what's important um, more often than in times of disaster, maybe we would get further along. Um, this photograph here is, of course, of like a devastated house post Katrina. And um, I just wanted to kind of illustrate that there is a rebuilding that's happening. Um, people don't want to leave. <laughs> the place where they've lived their whole lives. And even though they're left outside of levy protection and they're living in poverty, they really have nowhere else to go and they don't know another way of life. Um, this is Nasi, well, Anis Verde. Uh, he's holding the jar of oil over in the gallery. And uh, he's been one of my primary teachers. This is his son and, and they're raising a house. This has become a very common practice in South Louisiana. Actually, there's a federal grant system where um, they did this before they were eligible for grants, but they're handing out like $120,000 to raise your home, and it's ended up being this total racket. 
Um, in this day, it's really funny because they had like the whole family there. Like the old men were under the house, and then they have like the teenagers with the chains, and there would be this like one, two, and these little rickety, you know, jacks and stuff. And then this is your final product, which is a uh, trailer house, 18 feet in the sky. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is for us. Um, but I, I know that, you know, it, that is a solution and um, it's better than having water inside of your house and having to sweep it out, which has been pretty common in the last couple of years. Um, when I first came out here to Mesa, I showed some of these images of the flooding and people just immediately thought, oh right, this is from Katrina. And I was like, no, it's a little tropical storm, you know. Um, so, in this too, where I was showing you the oil pits, it's less than half a mile from where this photograph is taken, and the water comes in on both sides, right, and so it's just everywhere. Same with this, this image of, of the kid, and, I, and this was taken in like 2004, I guess. Um, and I remember it was like Christmas, we all like ran outside, you know, that morning, and there was water, there wasn't a whole lot of water. Um, you know, I mean, it was like a foot deep or whatever. And then I realized, I was like, oh my God, this is like toxic water, like, and babies in it, you know? Um, but it's a way of life that you kind of get numb to, I think, you know? And, and then you have Katrina and you have a 1.1 million gallon oil spill and, and now you have BP and, you know, this is a very common kind of situation and then you know what are your after high school you know where do you go from there and you either work for oil and gas industry or you work in service industry but everything essentially is tied to oil and gas in south louisiana you know even if you're working in service the people who are coming in are probably employed by the oil and gas company so i mean it's hard to point the finger especially when you're on a blue collar coast and you feed your family from working you know offshore this whole kind of fishing farming, hunting way of life, that was definitely a part of my ancestors, um, not so distant past, you know, my grandmother definitely made a living working the waters and the land. Um, that's something that I've seen in the last 10 years start to really disappear. Um, and, you know, the shrimpers, there were, they were fighting Chinese, you know, shrimp imports before Katrina and before BP and now they can barely, you know, afford to just go out to pay for their gas to hope that they catch anything. Um, and from what I hear, the shrimp season has not been so good. All the shrimp are really small and of course there's controversy with is the seafood healthy or is it not? And I have my own opinions on that. So, um, I mean, I guess that I, <laughs> I've said a lot, um, so if someone wants to, if anyone wants to ask a couple of questions or um, statements or, I'm just going to let the slideshow kind of, kind of keep going, but I have said, I think, um, most of what I wanted to say. I have uh, participated in roundtable discussions, especially post-BP, we have this um, Delta Discussion Group, and it's a uh, coming together of, of nonprofits, uh, NGOs, and um, and then other community and business meetings. And so we would use the photographs as kind of a springboard to talk about what's happening. And then other, you know, I like to I like to use it for discussion. So normally I'll do a little, you know, picha kucha. Do you know that phenomenon? Well, um, it's this sharing. You know, you get five, twenty seconds. Uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds a slide, so it's nice sharing. So I've done it, you know, in Louisiana that way, which is nice. So, yeah. The Reclaim Coast Commission in Louisiana have been, have been planting oak trees mm -hmm. along the uh, original line or the 1950 line. How's oh. that project going on? Um, I'm not really sure about the, the Reclaim um, project. I know that there's a lot of different uh, initiatives out there for replanting, um, but I don't, I'm not really familiar with, with that. I mean, it's such a huge endeavor, you know, to, to kind of replant the coast and also to, to maintain it and all of that. I know that a lot of these other kind of tree planting companies or organizations have had, they've had their troubles, but... 
there's an effort there, which is really beautiful to see people out planting cypress and oaks and you know bottomland restoring bottomland hardwoods. I uh, just uh, kind of getting back on what he said. I'm from Homa. Yeah. In the general area. I am Homa. Yeah. All right. My step, my stepdad is also. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but there's a uh, due to some Louisiana has had some crazy governors and a lot of uh, corruption, especially in the cities. And I, what I've been told is years ago around the Huey P. Long era, there was actually a they signed a lot of legislation that doesn't allow us to reap a lot of the benefit of the like, historic taxes. Leander Perez, he, um, he was trying to fight for 100% of the revenues, or the royalties, from um, offshore oil and gas. And uh, I think like New Mexico and California, they get 50%. Right, and I think that ours is just, we don't get anything, yeah. hardly. We don't see any and we're supposed to get it by 2017, which is supposed to be for all this coastal restoration, and we're also supposed to be getting all of these funds from BP, which is supposed to go to coastal restoration, and that was like, you know, Governor Jindal's great big hope after the BP oil spill, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to save the wetlands, you know, it's like, okay. Um, but they're hoping, right, that, the, I mean, it's just... It's kind of just blatantly unfair, you know, especially given our like contribution, what we've sacrificed over the years and where we are right now. There's actually a really great book um, that was printed by Yale University Press, um, written by Ken Wells called The Good Pirates of the Forgotten Bayous. And um, my grandmother, uh, her, her son, Xavier, and my father and then my cousin, you know, they all stayed at the house together. And my grandmother has this really great story when she was 11 and she lived down in Pontchartrain. And at that time, you know, the, the Delta was alive, the chenires, the oak chenires that, chenier means like an oak ridge, essentially. They were all alive, you know, and it was a much more healthy place. But anyway, she rode out a hurricane in a piro, which a piro is a flat bottom canoe. So when she was 11, she rode out a storm in a piro with her family, tied to a tree, with her father like standing, holding the rope all through the night. And she has a story of like the cows going by and the whole thing. Well, fast forward, and you know, 80 years later, she's stubborn. She's not leaving. I go there. She's not leaving. Not leaving. I'm like okay. My dad's laughing. He's like, we got two piros on the back porch. If things get bad. We're gonna get out. And so I'm in Baton Rouge watching as like the eye of the storm is coming over my house in Saint, my grandmother's house in St. Bernard, you know, and I call and my dad picks up the phone. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe this. He's like, Yeah, we got some good telecommunications in St. Bernard. I'm like, yeah. Well that was the last time I talked to him. Um, and it was like six days later. And finally we found out that my grandmother had made it to Houston. Now, mind you, this woman doesn't read or write her own name. Her English is pretty broken um, to start with. She speaks a very, you know, patois French, Cajun French. Um, so what had happened was the water came, and my dad got in the Piro boat, and he went to go find another boat. And meanwhile, my grandmother and my elderly uncle were in another Piro boat waiting for him to come back. And from there, they went to a neighbor's barn, and from a neighbor's barn, they ended up on a shrimp boat, and from a shrimp boat, they walked the levee. She's 90, mind you, and my uncle was 70. And then, yeah, I find her in Houston, and she's just like, I was never scared. She's like, you never believe, Monique. The refrigerator just fell over, and my shoes were all around me, you know? She's like, but I was never scared, she said, you know? So she's, she's a tough cookie, but um, yeah, so it's great. But The Good Pirates of the Forgotten Vice is a great story, and it kind of takes all of Because St. Bernard Parish, you know, over 90% of the parish was all underwater. Like I said, we had 11 feet. And that was all because of the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, which is this shortcut, man-made shortcut from the Gulf of Mexico to the port of New Orleans that the Corps dredged. And they didn't maintain the levees. And the le not that I think the levees are our end-all, save-all by any means. But um, you know, the levees just crumbled and the water just came in. So yeah, she said it was amazing. I mean, I couldn't imagine seeing the water just she was like, go get the boat, you know? <laughs> What college did you go to? 
Um, I, you know, when I first came out here in um, 2005, I had taken some night classes and things at um, Tulane and Loyola University. But then um, in 2007, I went back and I went to Loyola University in New Orleans and, um, and got my degree in mass communication there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're good. You know, um, I find that I was going to UNO and they weren't I mean, requiring reading and writing at all. And the Jesuits are pretty hardcore about like your reading and writing, you know. So I'm really glad that I went there. I'm, I'm much stronger. I've always been kind of a, not a naysayer on education, but I don't think that like education is the end all be all. I mean, I started taking these photographs way before I went to college, you know. But it's been able, you know, I've been able to, to find a way to share the images and to be more articulate and to have skills to be able to share them in a, in a different way that I didn't have before. I just graduated in May. So, and I'm working on this documentary film right now called My Louisiana Love, which is essentially a story about my life, but in the context of the last hundred years in South Louisiana and kind of juxtaposes my life and my grandmother's life and the series of like environmental injustices from the land being taken away from, I don't think I said this earlier, that they're Native Americans. I didn't. I'm like, oh, we're home um, the, So the French, my grandmother, if you were asked her what she is, she would say I'm French Indian. Um, which was like, what does that mean, you know? But, um, you know, when the, the French, they had a totally different policy than the English when they were coming in and, and conquering the new land. And they were very much so like intermarry with the natives, you know, make Frenchmen. Um, so yeah, you know, and so there's all, and of course when they were all, you know, there was so much change happening. So it's Atacaba, Biloxi, Chitamacha, Homa, all of these different kind of Indian tribes, but now under the umbrella of, of the Homa nation, which Homa and Muscogee, which was kind of the the most spoken Indian language um, in the southeast, it means red. So Homa, you know, I'm Homa, I'm red, I'm a red person. Um, what's really interesting about the Homa is that they dodged the Trail of Tears. Um, you know, after the Louisiana Purchase, they started, and that was in 1803, they started moving all of the Indians west. And, and actually in South Louisiana, it was a depot for the Seminole. So they were bringing the Seminoles from Florida and then they were shipping them west from South Louisiana, but all of these Indians just went into the back swamps, found refuge way down the bayou at the end of the earth. And you know, modern day, they are still federally unrecognized, but are very much so, you know, identify themselves as being native. And they're left outside levy protection, they have nowhere to go, most are living under the poverty line, their skills are either tied to welding in the oil and gas industry, or driving a boat, or shrimping. You know, and all of those industries are very much so in danger. I mean, even the oil and gas industry is different than it was before. You don't, I mean, everything is. You don't need the manpower you needed at one point. It's, it is real life, you know, and people say I take good photographs, and it's kind of, I was saying, I feel like I'm the bearer of bad news in a way, you know, but then um, the people that I photograph, I love them dearly, and I think that they're beautiful, so, you know, I think that I can't take all the credit. You know, there's, a, there's an interaction and exchange there definitely allowing me to take their eyes and take their life and take what I've witnessed with them in our dialogue and share that in a way that, that that I don't think they would know how to, to actually do it. And I had never imagined that I would be here doing it in this way, you know? So I feel honored to, to speak for, for us. Um, this is actually the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, and there was a pier here. Oh, there it was a shipping, there was a pier, and then there was like the shipping channel sign. But, um, you know, this was only like 60 feet wide when they first, stretched it, and now it's like 200, or, and like I said, it's destroyed 600,000 acres of wetlands since the 1960s, which is pretty unbelievable. My little corner of the world is a microcosm that is reflected in other little corners of the world all over, you know, and, and we all have grandmothers, and we all have places where we love, and, 
you know, we're all living under extreme environmental circumstances that are not our fault, but we're totally tied to and participating in, you know? So, yeah, thank you for saying that.